Hi, my name is Todd Kelly. And this is Marcus Hendricks beside us, me, and we both do walks. We've been doing walks for since uh, 2014, actually, and um, we're here to try to share with you a story, a condensed story of those walks, um, which is going to be a bit of a challenge, but we'll do our best at it. And it's called the title of the walk series that we had this year it was called "The Tale of Two Worlds: European uh, Collision into the Nature of Cape Cod," and Two Worlds, Taylor Two Worlds, or Two Worlds Collide is not a unique title. It was actually done, uh, University of Tennessee did it, McClung Museum in uh, 1992 for the 500th anniversary of Columbus. And there's other, but it's been used in different ways other, other than that as well. Uh, but the we use the uh, European collision because Taylor Two Worlds kind of collides uh, colliding together kind of implies that they're both moving and North America was here and Europe collided into North America. So that's where we want to go uh, in some of those um, early explorations up to the pilgrims. So um, so wonderful. Uh, why don't we uh, hear a little bit about yourself? Uh, introduce all right. yourself well, a little my, bit. Again, my name is Todd Kelly and I grew up in Chatham. Uh, I'm uh, actually of Irish descent. My ancestor was David O'Gillier, the Irishman. Uh, he came here approximately 1650, 52 as a bond servant. And uh, so we have a got to see a different side of, of life here and growing up. But we've been here uh, since then. I'm actually a Mayflower descendant from William Brewster and Stephen Hopkins. So I'd be 14th generation there, 13th of Thomas Prince and 12th of my father, direct line of a Kelly uh, genealogy. And that's what I do these docs for was that um, it was just, it's for, uh, I grew up with strong, simple, simple way of Cape life, traditional life, lower Cape. And those values were so important and um, been trying to preserve those values, to pass them on, whether they can be preserved or not, is just passed on. So that's what I do and what I've been doing. And it just so happened that I met Marcus uh, in 2014, leading a walk at uh, in Orleans for Orleans Conservation Trust at Hosey Swamp. And um, we met and we realized that we actually had met prior to that um, at the Mashpee Meeting House, in fact. And um, we've kind of gone from there. Wonderful. Thanks. Sure. So I'd like to uh, introduce myself. My name is Marcus Hendricks, uh, Mashpee Wampanoag and Natick Nipmuc. Uh, both my tribes are instilled in me, the culture, the um, the social atmosphere, and the indigenous ways that I was um, taught by my ancestors and my elders in my tribe um, helped me with my visions and my past um, going going forward. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that um, that happen to us and in, in our com different communities and like Todd shares you know what happened to him and his family um, in, in our walks um, we we talk about what we've learned in our experiences um, and the experiences that happened um, with other families Cape families um, on Cape Cod um, so from my nip my Nipmuc side um, is, is Thomas Speen uh, and that's from Natick uh, and we were also moved after um, a period of time, um, not not by choice, but we were moved to New Newton, uh, present day Newton, uh, which became New you know Newtown, which were, was a Christian um, removal uh, of the natives, uh, and then Mashby was uh, another location for for the Hendricks and Attiquin part of my family, um, also Eastern Pequot um, from my great grandmother's side. So Todd, uh, where uh, where do we want to begin? Well, I think we would like to start with first offering our gratitude to um, how this came about. Howard's Conservation Trust has really been an uh, integral role in, in uh, Michael Locke there as the executive director. Uh, this is where I started doing walks, um, volunteer-based walks, and it was really led to how Marcus and I uh, met. But we have been doing, uh, as this last year was supposed to, the 2020 season, uh, we had 30 walks scheduled and due to COVID, we knew that they would be canceled and really they had just had to be, the whole season really had to be canceled. I know Mike tried to hold, hold the door open that maybe we could come back and do it, but we just can't 
we're obviously in a different time now. And so it was, we want to extend that gratitude to the Harvard's Conservation Trust. Also, the other trusts or foundations that have uh, partnered with us, Chatham Conservation Foundation, and that's really where it started for us, coming together, Orleans Conservation Trust, uh, and then we included all, actually we were gonna do, um, this year would have made every town except for Bourne that we would have led a walk in. And um, that's, that's pretty, you know, we're pretty proud of that. And all of those walks are, are sharing stories that are all connected, but they're specific to that area. So when we uh, go to a property, the story is is what's really been happening beneath your feet. And growing up on the Cape, you know, even though you lived in one town and it was insular, and growing up at Chatham, we were we were pretty insular. But as Marcus said about uh, being taught by elders, there was elders in the community. You knew you were part of a. A greater community, and uh, if you got in trouble, you know word got out fast, so your parents would know before you got home. Um, so you kind of were safe in that respect, or not so safe. But um, uh, so all of these trusts uh, were able to by sponsoring them uh, these programs with us, co-sponsoring, we were able to bring this this the greater story of Cape Cod uh, and its interaction between European exploration and, and settlement, early settlers and the native people, because. From my side, uh, growing up on Lower Cape, uh, to live here generation after generation, it was always about the people themselves. It came from the people themselves, Monomoy, Chatham. This was a story that was told, that was passed directly from Mattaquas and the Sachem, the, the old Sagamore, to William Nickerson, through William Nickerson, to descendants. And I contained that in an essay I wrote. So if I may just reach down here and grab it. Um, this is, uh, going to be uh, at uh, the Cape and Islands uh, Historical Association Symposium. It's on Cape Cod's importance in Plymouth Colony. This would be October 17th this year at Knight Theater in Barnstable High School. Well, it was supposed to already happen in, in May, and due to COVID, that was canceled. Well, the you won't see this, but it's uh, the, the essay that I wrote is called In the Shadow of the Old Sagamore and Our Reflections of Liberty. And I stand by that. Everything I have to say is in this old Sagamore. So, so so I know you can't really see that, but I hope you read it. It's going to be out in uh, August, um, and then hopefully it'll get out other ways in the booklet. That it's a, a number of essays that are compiled by the Historical Association. So, so. yeah, the um, the the collaborations on Cape Cod have been very pivotal for Todd and I. Um, you know, ourselves coming together like brothers, um, working together and and to create these walks. Um, the, the, the walks wouldn't, wouldn't be able to happen without the historical societies. They wouldn't be able to ha happen without people that are participation. So um, I want to thank all our participants, um, everybody that signed up, um, dealt with us for two hours. Some of our walks went for two and a half hours. Um, we've had uh, rain. We've had sleet, snow. Um, some of our walks, you know, have been really hot, dealing with bugs. I mean, you know, dealing with the elements. But um, the people that were there clearly wanted to be there and support uh, for what we were about. And um, especially, you know, the historical societies um, helping us, um, you know, write their grants and incorporate us into their into their cultural atmosphere. Um, also, um, early on, um, putting trying to bring things together and a lot of the uh, communities friends of cape cod um, friends of well fleet you know all, all the different um, friends communities that help us um, and and support us uh, it just it doesn't feel like you're alone you know it just feels right. like you know we have our family support we have our community support um, and you know uh, everyone reaching out and wanting more and wanting more and asking questions and participating on our walks um, some of our walks um, paid walks um, started off, you know, with 60 people on the walks. Some of our free walks um, and um, talks, we actually had to um, reschedule other walks because um, there were just so many people that signed up. Um, and, you know, I feel that people want to know what's what the what the history is, what's around them. Um, and not just get it from one textbook or, or from one um, 
one location. They want to 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 broaden their education and and learn from the locals and learn from the people that have experienced it through generations, um, experienced it through their ancestors, and um, have been able to gather this this information. Um, so you know, it's it's important that um, you know people keep asking the questions. Um, you know be involved, get involved, and uh, not let it go fall by the wayside because the history literally is underneath your feet. Um, I've done a lot of archaeology work on Cape Cod, uh, cultural resource monitoring, and the history is there. Um, you just need to um, ask the right people the right questions uh, and be in the, in the right situations. So, Todd, what else do we want to cover today? So, um, <clears throat> that's it. It's that you, by walking these properties, you're connecting with the land. And that's the that's the, the fundamental thing is when you live on the land, um, you've got a real stake in it. And uh, especially when it's passed on as to, through generations as to why you did things certain ways, certain customs that were, were um, would be here that are vanishing now. And it's also in the language itself. That was another thing is that where did all the old words go? And within those words, in the same with, we'll show a map later about, it's the Simeon Deo's map of Cape Cod in 1620, even though it was created in 1890, but it shows place names, the communities, and in those place names, the words themselves tell you about where they are. So to start right off is, um, let's go back to our title, the tale of two worlds, European collision into the nature of Cape Cod. So during the 16th century, lots of European exploration going on here, all the way down in Florida, but we won't even go with that. That's where the Spanish, but here in the Northeast, uh, actually Sir Walter Raleigh is the one who, um, and he goes the seaboard to the south as well. But um, this is where the Northeast becomes uh, this Virginia territory, this Virginia charter, it was called. So even at that time, it was, it was evolving, but there were many different explorers here. So we probably know of Verrazano, 1524, but um, Jacques Cartier, there's there's some numerous. Uh, Gosnell. Gosnell in 1602, Martin Pring in 1603. This is where, this is might get a little touchy, just, uh, touchy for us because um, this is what we believe in, this European concept of state, of economy, and that's what they were doing, actually, with uh, Martin Pring in 1603. Um, again, this is the Northern Territory of Virginia Charter. Uh, we're part of that. Um, so they were actually backed by what was called the Bristol Merchants. And that may make sense to us. Oh, okay, these are underwriters supporting this exploration. And one of the things he was actually going for, coming here for was our sassafras. Um, so... They're it's actually it's called exploiting commercial opportunity, uh, looking to create a port, finding ports. This is Gosnell trying to find, not actually going to settle himself, but finding places that are going to be viable ports uh, for commercial, for trade, for in, uh, influence. Because the French, the English, and the Spanish, the Portuguese are in this, the Dutch are in this. This brings us to the, actually before that with the Dutch, but... Um, so all of this is going on, and, and we don't have the time to get into all of that, and that's really not the what we're this story is so much about. So we'll go to the French, with uh, Samuel de Champlain comes here. Actually, it's a man called de Mons, and of course they're in Maine, uh, and then they relocate over to Nova Scotia, is where they they make their headquarters, and de Mons with with Champlain, they come into uh, down into Cape Cod. Now, mind you, other people have been here uh, sailing around and charting these waters. And so they bring Champlain as a bit of a cartographer. Well, before him, there were uh, Jacques Lemoyne and the French Huguenots down in Florida is uh, 1564. But then John White at uh, Virginia uh, in, uh, was at 85, 1585, and they're doing watercolor. So they're drawing maps of the, sh of the shoreline. They're also drawing about the people and also flora and fauna, so important, to, and send this information. Today we take that all for granted. We can take a photo, 
go on Google and, oh, that's what it is. And people didn't know those things. So as these map makers were, were charting this, this information was very vital to the next explorer because they based that on them. So this is what Champlain was doing uh, in that 1605 time where he comes down to here into, into Cape Cod Bay, De Mons from Nova Scotia, and they actually are they're surveying the shoreline. Uh, this is all of Cape Cod Bay, Plymouth, uh, around to the, to the tip of Cape Cod. So it's Cape Blanc, uh, White Cape, that's Provincetown. And they make it as far as the way down uh, to Malabar, which is uh, East Ham, Nosset Inlet. And that's the map that Marcus has first. So he draws this, and they encounter the people at Malabar, Port Malabar, Port de Malabar is Port of Bad Bar. And he draws it pretty well in the photo. I don't know if you want to sh try to show that, but I don't know if you want to. We won't talk too much about it, but I know Marcus has interest in sh showing the Port Fortune one, is that um, the drawing is actually pretty good. Uh, if you're familiar with the area, it, it makes sense. But the inlet has changed. The Nosset Spit was actually the north, the East Dam side, and that has vanished and more, and the, the inlet has, has crept northward. Um, and the, the boats, the bark itself was able to come in. So he shows in the drawings, and this is what cartographers do, is they, they show multiple things that are going on. So it isn't like one snapshot, and this was all going on at the same time. He's trying to communicate stuff. But he, he, he shows it pretty well at Salt Pond. It showed Town Cove, the entrance into Town Cove. Um, and so the community is, uh, they're cleared land, so they have their growing fields and their wheat twos and their summer wheat twos. And I think I'll leave that for Marcus to go on to expand on. Well, thanks, Doc. Yes. So I uh, just want to just, just set the stage for this because, uh, you know, um, prior to this, um, this era or this time, uh, you know, you had indigenous people living here on Turtle Island. Uh, this represented um, the Eastern Gate. This this represented the 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 Maryland, right? Because everyone recognized that this place was untouched and inhabitable. You know, in, in like from from Aboriginal standpoints. Um, and but for a couple couple hundred years, probably five hundred years, um, you had people um, exploiting the fisheries. Um, you had pirates. You had you had other people that were coming in contact with the coastal natives. And uh, the, the one thing I want to point out early is that um, you would only come in contact with a native on the shoreline during the spring and summer months. And we talked about that a lot on our walks. So when people draw these maps, they would only be able to interpret these maps if they knew where we lived at certain, certain periods of time. We were semi-nomadic. Most of the people in the Northeast um, lived uh, in the spring and summer on the coastal coastal areas, and in the in the winter and the fall, they would migrate towards large lakes and ponds, um, where they would, they would be trapping, hunting, fishing, and doing uh, lodge ceremonies. Uh, so, you know, some of these maps, um, when we you know we, we discuss them a lot of on our walks, um, some of them aren't really correct based off of um, what what the cartographers want to perceive, but they, you know, these maps, um, they don't go in order. They, they try to, um, uh, you know, portray a period of several different encounters all on one map. Um, so, um, you know, they, they are, they are helpful to, 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 to provide the contrast. Um, and that, that is where the reader has to get both sides of the equation. They have to learn from the local natives. They have to learn from the, the, the ship, the shipmen's, the sea captains and learn from, uh, the people that, that lived, um, amongst, amongst these people at that time. Um, so, you know, I think they're, they're really important, important to have a conversation about. So on that, the Nosset Spit, there was actually the carpenter Mayo was, was killed. And, um, so he was a, a, a Frenchman that was, um, he was, it was determined that it was non-native other people that had done that. And you can't get into all that story. But so there was a, that was the first, um, well, I don't know if it was a, say it's the first, but it was uh, a, an incident that 
kind of put, you know, it's, it, it, the lives are on the line. So during this time, the 1605 voyage, now they go back. They're leaving, they go back uh, north to um, uh, Nova Scotia. So the next voyage that Champlain is on is another man who's the captain is to Portnacourt. And to Portnacourt, now to remind you that most of the, the, the sailors that are on there, the ship sands, they're probably, they're, they're seamen. They've been around. They've been on different ships. And so they would know things. And this was one of the things with de Portnacourt is that they, they ended up surveying the same shoreline that they had already they had previously short, uh, surveyed. So they wasted a lot of time from their perspective and so there, there was probably this undercurrent of kind of disgruntlement toward the Portnacourt because they've spent so much time in Cape Cod Bay surveying this they come make make it and now mind you with sailing ships uh, the prevailing winds are there's in time of year is an important factor in here what you can and can't do so they come to Port Malabar uh, in 1606 and uh, their uh, the wind basically dissipates so they put in at a little island off of uh, present day the the Orleans side right at the East Ham line uh, there would have been uh, land out there actually it was called Tucker's Terror uh, not this island but it's it's this is all glacial that has a, has been pulverized by the ocean currents off Chatham probably went out a good seven miles point uh, point Gilbert is, uh, was a, another one yeah so the, so those large boats wouldn't have been able to come so close right and that's what with Chatham happened was that they came in at Port Malabar they were familiar with that they got off the boat to meet with the natives that they'd already befriended everything was okay then the wind picks up oh we've got to go so they get on ship and it takes them south from the short distance from East Ham off of actually current day Orleans by then, um, Nosset Heights, and they go south. And as they are heading south, they come into the shoals of off Chatham. And this is what happens with the with um, cartographers or with this information is the Lemoyne didn't call it, the, the, the shoals off Chatham weren't called the, the great, he didn't identify him as the great rip of Malabar. That's what other um, people, other mariners interpreted from his information. So it was a great rip that extended the length of present day, what we call North Beach, but Nosset Beach. And um, so the prevailing winds were putting them right on the bar. And and uh, they were they were surrounded by white water. They were seeing the breakers and they were looking for, uh, now the ship drafted set pretty low in the water so they were sounding they were always sending out sounding ropes to 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 see how many fathoms they had and they were in they needed four uh four feet of water and there were times when they were at four and a half feet and less and so they put their best lookout up in the, the, the crow's nest and they were looking for deep water to get out so it took some able seamanship to to not wreck well what happened is the ship actually did bound hit the bottom where they actually did and it broke their rudder they had a, a metal band around their rudder so they had to fix that they tied it with rope and so on they put in with a with a shallop a smaller boat that's both road and can have a sail and they didn't dare go over the bars to come into the shore the native people however um, which we could say are Nosset or Monomoyak at that point um, it was been Monomoyak and they came out their machines were able to come out through the surf and they told them of how to get around uh, what we would call North Beach and so it took them a while to get out and uh, they they headed south and then they could see uh, that there was through the breakers all around them see that there was an inlet and that's the Monomoy point so they named that Cape Arturier where the uh, water slams on the shore uh, the sand uh, crashing on the sh waves crashing on the sand the banks and that's what Barturier is so again this Malabar gets extended to uh, Monomoy Island but Champlain himself, they, they didn't name that that. It's just the continuation of this journey. So what was the season? What, what time? This would have been actually October, um, okay. early October. So right around then, uh, October, we would just be getting over, uh, they, sometimes they call it Indian summer, but mm. it would be, it'd be our uh, green corn harvest and festival time, mm. getting ready for the winter lodges. 
uh, and the winter lodges are uh, more elongated, uh, several fires in them, and they're covered with bark. Uh, the spring and summer homes would have uh, cattail, bulrush, reed coverings, and there would be small isolated homes uh, where, where we would um, be on, congregating on the shorelines. Um, so. So what else? What else do we have to add for that? Well, so they make it into present day uh, uh, off uh, present day Stage Harbor, and they're actually able to. They're sending men in. They're actually putting stakes because the tide won't allow them to come into the harbor. So uh, this is pretty treacherous area for a sailing ship. So they do actually, you know, they're they're good seamen. So they're uh, watching the tide. They know the incoming tide. They're marking it to see how deep it is. So they put in with their shallop and they create actually at Stage Harbor, present day Chatham. Uh, they create a a, a, a beehive oven to make bread, and they also make their first metallurgy where they fix their they repair their um, rudder and the people are fine with this um, but what happens to keep this short so we don't because we, we, you have to come out on our walks because we get into uh, more specific details but um, so what happens here is actually the port accord is like okay they they've got stuff on shore but they want to bring that stuff what they can back to the to the bar and um, so this is a fundamental thing that the Portner Court does is that he marches the men. So he has a good 10 or 12 arquebuses. These are the matchlock uh, predecessor to uh, flintlocks. And they march through Greater Chatham into the interior. They, go, they say as much as three to four leagues. So basically they marched from Stage Harbor into West Chatham, present day West Chatham, over to Chatham Port to North Chatham, back around what is the village, back to, to uh, Sequansa, to Stage Harbor. This upset people. And yeah, so, so, you know, prior to this, uh, like I had mentioned before, you had, uh, well, Todd had alluded to the different uh, cultures that came here, but we, we had uh, continuous trade. We had people that did visit. Um, the, you know, there's reference uh, to the the large mass of the ships looking like floating islands uh, off, in the, off in the horizon. Um, so, you know, people didn't march through the land with um, heavy artillery. They didn't march with shields um you know there there was a trade at the beach um there you know later on uh in the early early 1620s there's a trading post um this frontier was 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 you know um not sustainable for anybody other than the the inhabitants of the and of the of the area to survive on um but for for them to march through there um there had to have been more to that. They, they, you know, and that would have been a been a ripple effect. Um, Aspinet would have heard about that. I'm sure Iano uh, and those are the sachems and the and the the chiefs of the time, uh, as well as as well as um, other other chiefs and sachems and, and clans clans. Uh, so that 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 is big because now now you're not just coming ashore to trade. Right. You're marching through the land without women and children right so what are you doing here right you know and, and that's it they were this is a breaking down of decorum of di diplomatic decorum cultural and social decorum and they actually delighted in it they took they they knew that they were they were intimidating the people and they took delight in it and they they knew they could in sense i'm cut this short have their way but they didn't they did also Champlain is identifying the people as savages already in 1606 so to, to speed this up um, what they also realized was that the people were starting to now mind the, the calendar is off here this October 15th we're 10 days ahead now our calendar is 10 days ahead when we get to the pilgrims we'll catch up on that so it's actually later in October that they're here then this October 12th, um, I'm sorry, 16th, 15th. And um, so anyway, they uh, what's happening is the people are, are, I'll let you get back on that, was they're removing the, the, the mats off the wee twos. So they're anticipating when, when the French see this, they're anticipating, oh, they're up to, you know, they're going to attack us. And they're said to have 400 warriors. Well, 
that's that's not likely. What was happening was that in this whole sequence at Stage Harbor community, people from neighboring communities, native people were coming to see because the French were there for for quite a while and they were like, well, what's going on? You know, we're just here to see. And so that would be the appearance of all of these people coming to see them in this smaller community, sequence of community. And that's where the skirmish happens is the next morning, there's only a uh, deportment court tells the, the men to, to take everything away from the beehive oven. The cook is a, a rather rotund guy. He's getting a little tipsy. Um, the reporting court goes to bed thinking that everything is back off onto the ship and he's told that which means there was probably some merriment going on on the ship as well but the next morning is when um, they're attacked now there's only five frenchmen on shore at this time and they all end up dying except for one who goes back and, and um, survives he's in nova scotia but they there's it's a long skirmish and we just don't have time for all of it of how it went went on but they one of the things they did have is that of course their arquebus uh which was a new weapon for the native people to experience be on the receiving end of it they also had a small cannon and uh, they were able to lob shot at the people and he says that they ducked down and, and took cover and they don't know how many people were killed because the native people would have removed them this is really fundamental that um, and if you want to go into that right there on that. Yeah, sure. So it's the next. So like so so like Todd had said that um, the, the calendar is really important, too, um, because just right off the bat are uh, there's a culture clash of the, di the different calendars in the different moments um, where. You know, we're going into protective mode because we're getting ready for the winter, you know. Uh, so what would only really would be out on the shoreline would be hunting parties and last man gatherers um, to get ready for the winter. Um, so for 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 the whole tribe or for the for the community of important people that would come out um, to to see what was going on, they would have witnessed, um, you know, the, the Frenchmen on the shoreline cutting trees down. And uh, that wasn't one of our things. Um, we harvested uh, trees differently. We fell it, fell it by fire and only as needed. We collected uh, deadfall uh, during hurricanes or, um, you know, af after trees would, would, would uh, decay, uh, we would collect and harvest uh, deadfall. Um, but to see the them setting up and uh you know hanging out there on the beach uh we would have seen the different culture of the way they operate so their operations now these 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 are these are seamen um probably mixed in uh, merchants pirates whoever else uh was was a part of this party um the, you know they weren't you know and there there were no women and children so they were acting the way they wanted to act um and if they could they probably would have would have stayed and done more uh, but this this um this map here uh depicts um and but portrays what that what wanted to be portrayed at that time um here 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 you have um in the the top top left center you have a teepee okay uh, that style, that style type home uh, is from the from the, in the Midwest. Um, so right off the bat, did, did the cartographer really come to land or was the cartographer trying to portray um, a skirmish and, uh, and, an, and an, uh, a, a, an indigenous savage or what was that, you know, cartographer trying to portray at the time? Um, and. You know, so they, they have to try to squeeze everything in one map. Um, and, you know, that that is that is the thing that is still kind of going on today um, where um, the in indigenous people don't have a voice. There's always people speaking for them, um, coming in and, uh, you know, you know, pushing them aside for whatever reason it is. And, you know, it's still ongoing. And um, it's happening in different communities where the local people are losing their voice or they're not being uh, promoted um, for their for their hard work and diligence um, for trying to keep their community alive and survive with their uh, ever ever changing things that are going around them. Uh, so so during this fight, um, 
what else what else happened what else happened with the skirmish um you know the the native people um you know are are having uh, volleys shot at them um so what what do you think what do you think is the re retaliation what what should the native people have done or what well what they, do you think yeah they they dug up the the those that that uh, actually two so there's only three bodies that were were buried and they erected a cross. It's actually probably the first um, Catholic service uh, that they, so they erected a cross. The French did. And when they went back to their their bark there, um, many people they uh, and, you know disrupted the bodies. So they were actually going to burn the Marcus. I think you had said that about burning the shore just a while ago. Um, they burned. Um, they were preparing to burn. They were tossed them in the heath. Those are the blueberry, which we were coastal heathland, um, and they tore down the, the cross. They were, and of course, this infuriated the French. They tried to come back. The tide wouldn't let them. They were a good had to, a good arquebus volley away, so they had to actually jump out and march through the mud, and a lot more going on. And for the sake of time, we'll have to keep it condensed. But it wasn't just cut and dry. It, it actually went on for a bit. And the French, they finally left uh, because the winds, actually, they tried to leave and the winds kind of put them, brought them back. And they, are we going to avenge, you know, this wrongdoing is what their perspective was. It seems, it seems like the, uh, the French were really trying to stay claims. Uh, yeah. And, you know, before, before the uh, English got here. Absolutely. Uh, and if it, if it wasn't from the for the, the the tenacity and the strength of the local indigenous people, um, I think this area would have been more inhabited by French and uh, you know. That leads right, very good. That that does that leads us to what happens here. This is how it gets. They call it Port Fortune. Uh, so at first it's okay. We had good fortune. We almost wrecked on the on the bars, and we were able to repair, restore our food stores, um, and then it turned into bad luck because this was port of misshappenstance. This is how when other people get the word, it kind of changes things. The Dutch named it uh, Bad Luck Harbor. I can't speak Dutch, so it's it's in their language, but it's bad. You can tell it's Bad Luck Harbor. So that's what it gets next. It gets named, but the the seamen, the French actually call it port of you know misfortune and um what happens is they actually do get off out in the sound and it's deeper water so they're able to make your way back to nova scotia and demos is stripped of now he's this leader that is stripped of his whole fur trade monopoly and that's something we might understand more is that oh this was a capital venture remember back to these the bristol merchants and we're about to get to the pilgrims with the uh, uh, uh merchant adventurers the london company so we would understand that oh he's now bankrupt he had he's this is a man of integrity if you will of social standing and he's now stripped of all of that relieved of that so we can start to think the ripple effect for them for the native people this would have been stirring for a long while prior to the the uh english showing up and for the sake of time we ought to jump forward to this is a really important point is that when the uh, french came to uh the northeast um Many people were at their height of their culture. Um, when the pilgrims came here, they had been decimated by uh, pestilence, if you will. They called it Indian fever. Uh, most likely it was, uh, it's called the leptospirosis. It's rat urine, ratus ratus. It's, it's because of the, the, and it's actually still here with us. Um, there's debate, scholarly debate, of whether if that's the case or not, because there was such a die-off. But so let's let's jump forward to where the, at, because of this failure um, at Port Fortune, the French go north now. They don't bother with south. So it's not going to be New France. It becomes New England. So so at this time, uh, we use we have the Dutch, uh, yep. further south, uh, more like uh, near Long Island. Yep. Um, and there's also um the, you know so the british british or, well adrian block was uh, this is block island yeah. rhode island but he also um uh, came around around the point of, of uh, monomoy so yeah the Black dutch are in uh, of course that's going to be the new netherlands at the hudson and then even further south um not to go too far but florida 
Florida, well, you've got the Spanish, mm -hmm. uh, the English are vying for that. Of course, Portuguese, you had mentioned about fishermen. The Portuguese were the vital fisheries here. Um, mm -hmm. The Gulf of Maine, just extraordinary. Buzzards Bay, extraordinary. They all say the same thing. In, in down in Florida, they still say the same thing was you could walk across the backs of the fish. There was so much, yes. yeah. so much waterfowl and more. And so I think we ought to move forward to the English. Uh, as again, there were John Smith, we don't, can't get into him, but he's really the one that does the exploration here. He's the one that names Plymouth, Plymouth. Um, and that's where um, Thomas Hunt is, comes in the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, to Squantum, Squanto, actually 20 native Patuxic Plymouth men are captured, uh, are lured onto the ship, and then also seven Nosset men. So this is um, 1614. And um, when they and they're they're brought to um, um, yeah Malaga, Spain for the uh, uh, slave trade. So I think some sometimes uh, people forget the uh, the part of southern Maine um, where they had the, uh, the one of the first colonies, um, mm -hmm. uh, first northern colonies. Mm -hmm. It was uh, uh, Sajahawk. Um, and you're 1607, 1607. Yeah. and um, people forget that that didn't last so well. Um, but that that is uh, what was supposed to be the first northern, um, the northern post uh, for the London Company, and they were still trying to find an access route to gold um, and the interior. Um, again, um, they couldn't get through through to the Hudson because uh, the Dutch were already staking claim there. Um, and so they were still trying to find a way through the Connecticut area, uh, up to Connecticut River and Charles River. So um, they were really trying to um, penetrate and get into the interior, but um, weather, um, pestilence, um, disease, running out of money, um, and then coming coming in contact with the indigenous people, it seemed like they had to find a way to get rid of the indigenous people uh, of the coastal area so that they could uh, finish their projects or finish their... Um, their so it's, it's that it's capital venture is what it was. But the pilgrims are different than that. So we'll jump back on them because we're running out of time. But um, so the pilgrims are... are this is, uh, the reparation, Protestant Reformation, a lot going on in all three, you know, uh, England, Spain, France during this whole time. Uh, but um, so the pilgrims, Brewster, William Brewster, Scrooby Mansion, Scrooby Manor, um, he's, and then, um, uh, let's see, well, uh, William Bradford's a young lad there. So they're considered, they're trying to reform, but they're scrapping, they want to scrap the, the Church of England. And so they're separatists. This is illegal. They can't do that. The Puritans are trying to purify the church from within. They're not abandoning the church. They're trying to purify. That's a fundamental difference. You can call the separatists Puritans, but you can't call the Puritans separatists. Um, and I'll explain that if we have uh, quickly here. But um, so they, they find they're, they're actually incarcerated, Brewster is, and uh, William Bradford, young lad. And so they, they realize that they have to go somewhere and they go to, uh, the, to uh, Holland. They actually go to Amsterdam first, but then they go quickly go to uh, Leiden. And they have given up their agricultural North of England background to now more of an industrial uh, intellectual place. But as they live there, they're forming their, they form the Leiden congregation because they want to preserve, they want to create their own church. That's the real driving behind the pilgrims is they want to create their own church and they want to preserve English custom, culture and language. And the reason they go to come to America, they had already gotten safety in Amsterdam, in Leiden, but uh, in Holland, but their children were now being influenced by the Dutch. They were learning Dutch language. And if they married into Dutch lines, this was not what they wanted. So they had a choice. What money, they, they had to work in different trades because they couldn't be agricultural. So they, they purchased the Speedwell and they organized through, it's a long through, it was through this uh, London company, but um, it's to a grant to the New Netherlands. And James I, King James I, who really wanted to, you know, exterminate them, actually sided with it because um, 
they if they made it to the new world they would have english on the coast and if they didn't well that took care of that problem so they come they they mortgage their house they sell everything they're they're they don't have a choice anymore and so july 22nd 1620 they leave leiden with the speedwell to come to southampton england and join with the the mayflower this is where it comes like today is that the london company has now changed the terms they've got them over a barrel they changed the terms of the agreement the people are now bound to work seven days a week and more and more uh we go into this so and they have they didn't know it actually. yeah so it seems like a majority of them were just trying to to flee but they didn't know what was over the clouding them right they didn't know that they were going to be uh subjects right uh, so you have to, yeah you have the strangers and and so they actually the strangers who were people that now had a chance to own land that they never would have had in england have now joined the, the fray so from southampton they set a sail and the speedwell is proves to be unseaworthy there's reasons for that um they put in uh, so that's uh, october 5th they leave by october 13th they're at dark Dartmouth, England, um, and to repair the ship. They set sail again by October, uh, excuse me, August, sorry, it was July, August 5th, August 13th. Uh, they set sail and the, the ship is just leaking at the seams. The stress of the sail was just opening it up. They come back to Plymouth, England, and by September 6th, they set sail in only the Mayflower. So they go from 100 and 20 passengers plus 25 crew down to 102 patches and passengers so that's a real poignant story in all this that we don't have time with how they had to leave everything they their friends and they were going to join rejoin them uh, in the new world but their motivation wasn't even though they were backed by the london company this underwriter um, that's not their motivation it wasn't to make this they wanted to set up their own congregation which they had already done the leiden congregation uh, they had women and children and some livestock and um so that's that's mostly the first first couple generations weren't such a blunt force uh as far as trying to convert it was once once the, once the harbor once plymouth was set up right um i think the second generations it and, is it, they were able to uh up the ante uh, yeah. Because London Company invested so much, yeah. um, they um, wanted more. Right. They wanted more well, from their citizens and their subjects to, to for, as a kickback. Right. But they needed more land to expand. They needed more, right. uh, more area. Th um, that's the fundamental difference between Boston and Plymouth. Was that Boston? These Puritans, the separatists, came to Plymouth. The Puritans that stayed behind got kicked out of England 10 years later, and Winthrop and eight ships, uh, 3,000 people settled at Boston. And that's a capital, more of a for profit venture. And uh, so, the, right, you know, right around then, that was the big time when they started uh, Christianizing a lot of natives, right. um, especially the Massachusetts, right. uh, the Ponkapog, the Wampanoag Confederacy, Confederation, Confederation uh, was moved around onto Cape Cod and all over the place. Uh, the Nipmucks, um, a lot of them uh, had to flee um, to the western parts, also went down into Connecticut with the Pequots um, and the Narragansetts were all in the mix too down in Mount Hope. Um, so Todd, I just want to thank you uh, and sure. you know, I want to thank uh, the Lower Cape Media for this opportunity. Um, we're, we're going to be hopefully um, more doing more throughout throughout the seasons um, and staying um, staying in the community and helping people out um, to just getting these thought provoking conversations to help understand what went on and what's still going on today. Uh, so Todd, anything else you want to finish um, up? With? Well, just uh, to uh, just to, to put it out there again that you know the and the pilgrims thought that there was divine providence. You know they didn't have control of it, but the, when they came here. Uh, the people were very, uh, you know, very guarded. This is the whole first encounter. This is a very guarded situation because their population had been so decimated. And that's the fundamental difference is that the Mayflower foundered nearly on the same area. It was the same area, general area that the um, French did in 1606. So in 1620, English Mayflower uh, nearly wrecked uh there and if it weren't for uh, the seamanship of christopher jones to get him out of there um so 
But we just, I just hope you can keep that, uh, give that consideration because uh, those stories were passed, were held in. Plymouth gets to be called the America's hometown, and and old time people that that have grown up in Plymouth will share this. This, um, it's a direct knowledge. It isn't a history book knowledge, and that's what it was to grow up on the Cape. Is that it wasn't a history book. It was direct knowledge from the community from the elders, from your own ancestors or other people's ancestors, because you had common ground, common experience. And that's what we hope. That's what our walks were doing. And um, we sure hope that um, it, that it matters. <laughs> and um, you carry that on, because that's what, what uh, the oral tradition is what, what is what carries on. So thank you. Thank you. So if you'd like to learn more about um, uh, indigenous peoples of uh, Turtle Island, uh, you can see see me, my segment on uh, uh, se section two on uh, Native America from PBS. It was aired two years ago. Also, you can uh, check me out on WampanoagShells.com. That is my uh, local business. Uh, you can see Todd uh, at the uh, local uh, state parks. Um, he does a lot of work there. So um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.